All right, good morning, everyone. I've never walked onto Metallica before, so that's pretty cool. Um, <laughs> delighted to welcome David Schwartz, uh, C2 of Ripple. Um, thanks for joining us, as I said. Um, I think a lot of you probably know what Ripple is, but let's, let's just do a quick kind of primer on what it's about. So, uh, David, you want to sort of say what Ripple does? Sure. So, Ripple's a fintech company, and Ripple um, is focused on international payments right now, which is where the high friction is. And um, I would say that what we're working on is kind of um, getting, getting um, enterprise customers together, mostly financial institutions, banks, and non-banks and um, allowing them to negotiate their payments on a network directly, bypassing things like SWIFT or things that take multiple days to settle and allowing them to settle instantly. Yeah, um, this has been the narrative for a few years because I've talked to your CEO, Brad, you know, fairly often, and he's made the case this is a way for banks to save money, use XRP as kind of a bridge currency, but I've got to say, uh, it doesn't seem to be happening. It seems every year this is kind of the promise, but we're not seeing a lot of adoption. What's going on there? Um, I would agree that adoption of digital assets has been a little slower or I mean you could see it as being incredibly quick or incredibly slow depending on what time frame you think is reasonable. I would say revolutionizing international finance is not something that you would expect to happen overnight. But it is a multi-step process and I think the first problem that we encountered, I mean we kind of thought that we could take a direct line to settling with a digital asset and I think a lot of people thought that well now we have digital assets let's just use them for payments and that'll be that. Part of the problem is that the payment systems are just not capable of supporting instantaneous settlement. So if you think about a payment system like SWIFT, where you just kind of push a payment message out, and you don't necessarily know the entire path, and you don't know the fees until later, uh, you don't even know if the destination account even exists until sometime later when the payment is actually processed by the, the, by the destination institution. There's no way that you could build instantaneous settlement into a system like that. So we kind of found ourselves in this situation where if we wanted institutions to settle their international payments with a digital asset, we first had to rebuild the payment messaging, sort of the plumbing. And we discovered something interesting on the way. What we discovered was that the existing plumbing was so bad, I mean, it dates back to batch computing days, um, that just improving that messaging was a product. That was something that banks and non-bank financial institutions would be interested in. And so we focused on building a top-notch payment network that can settle with a digital asset. And I think it's fair to say that we haven't yet proven that we can actually settle with a digital asset. We're just making that transition from building a payment network that can settle with a digital asset to figuring out where you, you really want to settle with a digital asset and making that settlement happen. That's, if I can interrupt a second, that's my understanding. You built XCurrent, right, as a messaging product? Correct. And a lot of people seem to think it's superior to Swift. And you almost have this successful enterprise software business on your hands and good for you, but uh, it seems Ripple wants to do something more, which is to encourage the users of this to also wrap some XRPs into the transactions, but it sort of seems like you're shoehorning, some, shoehorning something in there that a lot of banks are like, wait a minute, we don't need this, we're just good with the messaging thing. So, so make the case for us why you need XRP in this. I would just start out by saying I think that is, that is a fair point. I think we do have um, a, a struggle on our hands to convince particularly banks because banks are extremely conservative, they're very slow moving. What we've discovered is that non-bank financial institutions, payment companies are much, much more aggressive and they're much more interested in things that can save them time and money and cost. And so we built the X Rapid product as a way to kind of solve that problem. And um, it, it was adapted to the real life situation that we were facing. We kind of had this idea that institutions would hold XRP or a digital asset, they'd make their payments with a digital asset, or regional hubs would settle with, dig with a digital asset. And for a variety of reasons, the world wasn't quite ready for that, including um, regulatory issues, lack of liquidity, immature ecosystem around digital assets. And so we couldn't aim directly for sort of the end state that we wanted. We had to come up with a more practical plan. XRapid is aimed at two things. So one of them is sort of remittance type international flows where cost is very high and the volatility actually favors a digital asset, which is kind of bizarre. Usually people say the problem with digital assets is they have such volatility. But here, if you think about trying to pre-fund Mexican pesos on a Thursday to make payments on a Monday, that's a lot of volatility in Mexican pesos. Whereas if you can use XRP, which can move across the planet in just a couple of seconds, the volatility is actually less. Even though XRP is inherently more volatile, you're only holding it for the minute or two it takes to complete the transaction. And I think the other thing that XRapid handles 
is you might have a bank that doesn't want to touch a digital asset. They're like, we can't have XRP on our books, we can't buy it, we can't sell it, it's just too much of a regulatory challenge for us. But let's say they want to make a payment in Mexico and they don't want to have to pre-fund and they, want, they don't want to have to work, get you know, confirmation three days later. What they can do is they can have an ex-rapid customer that probably won't be a bank, it'll be a payment company or some other type of institution that uses a digital asset to buy the Mexican pesos as an internal treasury function and then offers those Mexican pesos to the bank. So it's a workaround to the limitations that we found that we think is adapted to the way that, to the situation that we're in today. Right, and this is the part I've never quite got my head around. For this to work, you almost need like a local market maker who's gonna sit there and be willing to hold those XRP and move in and out of pesos or whatever exotic currency, like you often cite the Philippines is another one. What are, what are these companies? Like, you know, it's sort of like, Yes, that would work if these companies existed, but do they even exist? So this is one of the very interesting things. Like, if you had to go out and recruit somebody to do that, it would be very difficult. You'd have to pay them to do it, because why would they do it if not that someone was paying them? But because these systems are completely open, and I think this is one of the most important things that distinguishes us from our competitors, and is a sort of why would I use a digital asset? These systems are completely open. XRP is available to anybody. You don't need to agree to, with anybody to use it or hold it. And so if you have somebody who has a counter flow, like you have someone who has a bunch of grocery stores in Mexico and he's paying 6% 6, 6 to move his Mexican pesos into the United States. Um, he can just offer that liquidity. And what we've discovered, and, I, and honestly, I was surprised at this, like we had plans ready to pay people to make markets if that was necessary, and it has not been. What's happened is that people who have counter flows or people who have the ability to, set, to settle internationally have found these open marketplaces for the services that they offer. And what you get is you get a kind of netting. So typically, you could only net inside a closed ecosystem. But these ecosystems are completely open, and they can net. So people who are moving in one direction find people who are moving in the other direction. People with counter flows find each other. I guess you could argue that we might exhaust the, the existence of counterflows, we might exhaust the ability to net, but it doesn't seem so. It seems like that, that to my surprise, honestly, has not been an issue. The liquidity, the, if you build it, they will come, has happened in these open ecosystems because anybody who has that ability can participate. Okay, well, give us some examples. You mentioned a Mexican grocer, but give me like a success story or two of on the ground of someone who's deciding to you know, net with XRP. Well, in many cases, we don't know because these ecosystems are, com are completely open. Um, one of my favorite stories was in the very, very early days of the XRP ledger. It didn't involve Ripple, the company at all. It was completely organic. Um, somebody opened a gateway, which is essentially a company that issues a stable coin in Chinese uh, yuan. And there were remittance flows just immediately. There were flows in both directions. I think part of it might have been capital controls. People who really wanted to get money out of China were counter flows to the remittance flows. And they just found each other. Um, and all of the liquidity was gone immediately, like in a couple of hours, and the liquidity just increased. And it ramped up to about $8 million a day. Um, since then, that's disappeared. So I don't know if it's because the Chinese government cracked down or just uh, exhaustion. But there was a, compl uh, and I think also part of the sort of on-ledger liquidity was kind of not popular uh, today like it was back then. This was kind of during the crypto boom. But it just completely organically, people who wanted to move money into China found people who wanted to move money out of China and they set up their own like netting system directly on the ledger with nobody managing or running it. But you need an exchange to do that, right? Well, in this case, what you, what you, it was quite interesting. So you needed three components. So you needed some way to get you on, on and off the ledger. And there was a company in China that basically what they did is effectively they issued a stable coin. So you would give them Yuan and they would issue a digital asset and vice versa. The XRP ledger has a built-in um, decentralized exchange. So that decentralized exchange became the marketplace. Huh, interesting. Um, let's switch to stable coins because they're obviously kind of all the rage right now and everyone and their dog is issuing one from you know, JP Morgan to Facebook. But you know, especially what the banks are doing, I think last week a new kind of consortium of banks said, "Hey, we you know rolling out this new stablecoin." Does that kind of freeze you guys out, or? I, I think it's actually helpful. Um, one of the problems that people have is the ability to hold digital assets can be difficult, particularly with the volatility in some digital assets. Stable coins um, are safer to hold if you can trust the issuer. So I think to that extent, um, it can it can be helpful because that you still need liquidity. So if you imagine um, a dollar stable coin issued by JPM and you have maybe some other dollar coins issued by companies like Circle and, and, and everybody seems to be issuing a stable coin. And then you have stable coins in other currencies because if you're not in the United States, a dollar coin is not really all that stable. You still need liquidity between those stable coins. And I think it's also important to remember that these stable coins have counterparties and there isn't a universal counterparty. There isn't some counterparty that everybody in the world can have equal access to. It's gonna have to be in some jurisdiction. It's gonna have to be part of some regulatory regime 
regime. And so I think if, if the vision is this sort of open participation, this sort of internet of money, collateralized stable coins will be players, but I think there will still have to be liquidity between them. And if you imagine dozens of stable coins, hundreds and hundreds of markets is probably not gonna be as efficient as going through some sort of, um, sort of assets that aggregate, like the dollar does today. The dollar sort of aggregates demand for smaller currencies, and we see XRP playing that role. And you're saying it's openness is going to favor it because it's easy to move in and out of. And yeah, I think if you can imagine, like, you might have a hub in one country and a hub in another region, how do you settle between those hubs? You need something that's neutral. You need something that's kind of jurisdictionless. If you want a sort of open participation ecosystem, you can't have things that are controlled by a single party at the center. Um, well, speaking of single party control, uh, what do you think of uh, Facebook's coin? Well, I think Facebook has a little bit of a trust uh, debt to kind of before they can credibly enter the space. And I think also being having a lot of money is not necessarily what you need to have credibility here. You, it, it kind of takes a, a sort of neutrality and a sort of lack of alignment. It's going to be interesting to see what they're able to put together. From what I understand right now, it is, uh, and they have not published their full details yet, but it looks like it's a collateralized asset. And in any collateralized asset, it's not going to be open because whoever holds the collateral can make the rules. Um, in digital assets, there's sort of an openness. There's no entity that has any legal right to dictate what the rules are. But if you have the collateral, obviously whatever you say is gonna go. So I'm not really sure that I see what's going to be fundamentally different. I wonder whether their, their goals are more like access, uh, putting themselves inside the transaction flows so that they can see them. Um, if they're more about regulatory arbitrage, where maybe they'll be able to have an asset that doesn't have as much regulatory control because another party is sort of governing the movement of it. I don't know that there's, a, that there's any fundamental change or improvement there. But again, we'll see when they publish their, their more de uh, okay. details. And it just, you know, it's rare I get to speak to someone who's actually sort of built a ledger like, like you have. Um, how do you think they did it? I guess we'll find the white paper's coming out next Tuesday, but if you had to guess, how do you think, like which, which protocol did they build on or did they come up with this from scratch? I, I think what they have is, is what we call technically federated Byzantine agreement, which essentially means you have a bunch of nodes that some central organization chooses. So there would be some governance organization. Facebook has suggested that it wouldn't be Facebook, that they would form some sort of a governance organization. And that governance organization would pick, um, preliminarily it looks like based on paying the money, they would essentially make you a member of this, um, this group that has to agree. Um, there are some advantages to that. It's not, um, it's not exactly the same as a centralized database. The advantage is that you're protected against malicious behavior on the part of a small number of members of that consortium. So it looks like, it, it looks like it's that kind of design. And it looks like the, the right to sort of govern the network will be sold. And I assume there'll also be conditions. I assume it won't just be you know, paying the money. But again, they haven't published what their governance is gonna look like yet, so it's kind of early to say. Oh, interesting. Um, and speaking with the decentralization, centralization theme, where are we with Ripple right now? Because you know, I know Ripple's long made the case that uh, it's, it's the ledger's decentralized, but you still have this massive trove of the majority, I believe, that you're sort of releasing in parcels. What's, where are we with that right now? Yeah, so Ripple's a company, and Ripple holds a significant amount of XRP. Um, the XRP ledger is decentralized. Ripple has no legal right to control it and no ability to control it. Um, there's uh, over 100 validators. Ripple still runs something like five of them. We don't have the ability to make unilateral decisions on the governance of the ledger. We have to get the other validators to sort of go along. It's kind of very democratic. Um, uh, that said, you know, Ripple does hold a significant fraction of the XRP. But, uh, you know, I guess it comes down to what you're, what, what you're concerned about with decentralization. If you're concerned about scarcity of the asset, it's the governance that controls how much of the asset uh, you know, there is. If you're concerned about sort of execution of transactions, you say like, I want equal access to the ledger with everybody else. I don't want someone to have some privileged access to the ledger, or I don't want censorship on the ledger, or, or that kind of thing. That's the operational governance. That's not who holds the asset. Um, so I, I guess I would say that's a way that the X, XRP and the XRP ledger is different from other digital assets, and whether you think that's a good thing or a bad thing depends on what you want digital assets to do. But I don't think it's a winner take all uh, this, this is, I think, something very important uh, and very important to make. We need our competitors to succeed. We need the ecosystem to succeed. Uh, an analogy I sometimes use is your cell phone. Like, everybody in this room probably has a cell phone on them, and that would allow them to tweet about this talk right now. But they don't hold that cell phone to tweet about this talk. They hold that cell phone because there's an entire ecosystem from Twitter's competitors. And so Twitter doesn't have to worry about, you know, how do we get people to have cell phones? How do we get people to have home internet access? No, they just say our target market is people with cell phones and home internet access. And we have those cell phones because of 
prior competitors of Twitter, companies like Facebook and MySpace, and they built the internet. And we need an ecosystem of digital assets that are going to succeed, and Ripple's not going to build that ecosystem single-handedly. You know, Twitter can't be in the cell phone business and the Wi-Fi business, and the, you know, they can't be in every business, and neither can we. And so uh, we, we, we want other digital assets to succeed. That makes sense. Um, so I'll ask you quickly, too, about the price of XRP. I mean, I'm, you know, I'm not a trader. I don't hold cryptocurrency. But it's sort of surprised. It used to be very volatile. It used to you know, mm -hmm. go from one cent to four dollars and everywhere. But last year, it seems to have really stabilized. Is, what's behind that? Is there sort of some hidden hand keeping that price in a narrow band? Or? I would like to think that it's a shift from pure speculation to sort of more utility. But I think I'm probably kidding myself if I try to tell myself that that's what's actually happening. Um, it, it's very, very hard to understand the price, and I think anybody who tells you that they think they know what's going on is probably, um, you know, you hear on the news, oh, the stock market, you know, went down in profit taking, but you know, why was there profit taking today and not yesterday or to tomorrow? Uh, I don't think really anybody knows. I, I don't buy this theory that there are, I mean, I think sometimes there are manipulation, but I don't buy this theory that there's like shadow organizations that are governing prices. I think it is, um, Largely in, in the sort of macro scheme, I think it is realistic speculation about what the prospect is for digital assets in general. And I think something interesting that you'll notice is that the digital asset market is very highly correlated. If it was a good day for Bitcoin, it's probably a good day for Ethereum, probably a good day for XRP, and so on up and down the line. And the reason I think that is, is I think the market understands that, that it, there needs to be an ecosystem and that either digital assets are gonna be a big thing or they're not, or at least they're not ready to kind of parse out the fine details. It's like if you worked for Google in the early days, you'd be super excited about search. You'd be like, search is the next big thing, we're gonna be the next, but you could also have been at Alta Vista or Lycos or Ask Jeeves or like, and you would have felt that same way I think it's kind of early to figure out who the winners and losers are going to be. And right now, it's just like, is this an exciting area or not? And I think the jury's still out, obviously. Obviously, I think it's exciting. Yeah, no, I think a lot of people do. Um, let's turn to our friends at the SEC. Mm -hmm. um, with um, that, uh, a lot of news last week with Kick and their defend crypto thing. Did Ripple take a position on that? No. Um, we didn't, and it's an, inter it's an interesting circumstance. So the SEC has largely been doing regulation by enforcement. They kind of gave a green light to Bitcoin and Ethereum, and then they kind of said, no, we didn't really give a green light to Bitcoin and Ethereum, but it's kind of perceived, at least in, in the space, as them, them giving a green light. And, and otherwise, they've pursued regulation by enforcement, initially against like really bad actors, like things that I think most people in the industry would say are outright scams. But what they haven't done is they haven't given any kind of regulatory clarity. So it's very hard for people to know whether what they're they're doing is going, whether the SEC is going to come back and say, you should have known all along. Ripple's a good example. We've been tremendously transparent about everything we're doing, and yet, you know, there's this possibility that the SEC will say, hey, you should have realized all along, or, you know, it's kind of an awkward situation for us. As far as the, you know, this situation specifically, I think it's probably going to be good that there's going to be a case that's going to get at least some regulatory certainty, although it will probably take a couple of years. I think Ken made an interesting effort to kind of astroturf a little bit and try to get people behind them as defending crypto. But I think something interesting kind of prevents the crypto space from being working together um, on regulation as well as they might, which is that if you perceive your, yourself as more legitimate than Ken, you don't want to be on stage with them. Whereas if you perceive yourself as less legitimate than Ken, they don't want to be on stage with you. And so everybody is trying to kind of carve out their own little, they're like, what we did is okay for these tiny little reasons. And if you were you know, part of Ken, what you would do is you would try to say what we did is okay, and you would make as narrow you would, as an argument as you have to do. So this idea that they can, you know, they're gonna defend crypto, I don't know, but obviously we're watching very closely to try. And I would say, one of the biggest obstacles to, to developing digital assets is regulatory uncertainty. It's not bad laws. It's not like, oh, there's laws that make it illegal. There's laws that make it difficult. There are some of those. But the biggest problem is this fear that government agencies will turn around and say, you should have realized that everything that we are doing was already illegal. Meanwhile, there's a robust debate over whether that's the case or not. It's, 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 it's not a... I think that's a good description, yeah, because what uh, you know, I think we saw is, you know, kick through a bit of a Hail Mary there, and, you know, then you saw the SEC aired some of its dirty laundry. Its mm -hmm. CEO should not have been going around saying you're going to make a profit on this. There was some sort of shenanigans, but at the same time, it does seem the regulators moving the goalposts a little bit, because a year ago they were like, oh, if you're heading towards decentralization, you're fine, and now it's like, watch out. So do you think, you know, the SEC has been a little inconsistent, or...? I think they haven't given clear guidance. They've give, they have something like a 15-point test with 11 sub-factors, which obviously for any realistic project, some of those are going to look good and some of those are going to look bad and some of those are going to be arguable both ways. So 
I mean, yeah, there definitely has been a lack of clear guidance. I think that's definitely uh, something that you could fairly say. Interesting. Um, we've got a few more minutes. What I'd love to ask you about, because I rarely get to speak on stage with the people who actually, you know, build blockchains. It's usually sort of the, you know, executives running them. You know, you built the XRP ledger, and I'm curious what you see. What has changed out there? What projects are exciting, going to work? What are, you know, what's going to fail? Think of just like, you know, the, you know, the DAP ecosystem, which seems a bit of a flop. And then you have projects like Definity. You know, I guess where's it all going? So I'm, I'm kind of. I was saying the jury's still out on the decentralized finance space. I think it could be really big, and I think it could it could collapse. I think it's going to depend on what other developments there are and what it has to compete with. There's a real shortage of, of actual use cases. Like, payments are here. We all know that international payments need to be improved. We all know that, like, you have these walled gardens and that, that payments need to be better. And if you're looking at things like lending or security settlement, there's always a payment going on or multiple payments going on in those same things. So I think that's really concrete and really ready to happen. Um, the further away you get from that, the more sort of speculative it gets. People look at things like lending, some of the early efforts. I don't know if you heard about the story with DAI, with the interest rates shooting up and the lack of governance. So I think the jury's out on that. I will say one thing that I think is going to be huge is micropayments. Um, this gets a little out there for this audience, maybe, but I think micropayments are going to sort of take over the world the way packet data kind of took over the world. I think that if you can make small payments very cheaply and you can make billions of them without a problem, then you don't need any. You don't need anything else. You don't need some special way to make larger payments. Yeah, tell me more. About, I wrote about that recently because it's near and dear to my industry. I've covered media for ten years, and you know, even ten years ago, we're like micropayments will save us because. Right now, you hit a paywall. Maybe you want to read that sports story. The local newspaper is like, subscribe, blah, blah. And you're like, nah, and leave. If there's something in your browser, you could just click and pay 50 cents to read. Is that close, or when do you think that's going to come, and who's going to bring it to us? So there's actually a web monetization standard. And what you do is um, there's a protocol called Interledger, which is a payment protocol that allows you to have a sort of receiving address that's universally understood. So why is email so great? You give me your email address, and that's all I need to know to contact you. Interledger does the same thing. Whether you receive bitcoins or dollars or XRP or whatever, you can have an Interledger address as long as there's someone who speaks that protocol who can receive the funds for you. The way this web monetization protocol works is you just put a tag in your web page that says, this is where you can send me money. And then your browser has a plugin. There's a company called Coil that's a web monetization provider, but anyone can do it. And what they do is they make a plugin for your browser that reads those web monetization tags and just sends them money. So if you go to a website, instead of seeing like, you know, we need to raise $50,000 to stay online, you'll see thank you for donating. Or if they have a members only area or a paywall, you'll just go right through it and you'll see a message that like, you know, thank you for sending us money through web monetization. Um, Coil made a billion payments last year, with the average payment being like a thousandth of a penny. So it's, it's, it's effectively streaming money. And what's nice about that is if you pay a certain amount of money to go through a paywall and it was a clickbaity article, you can't get the money back. Like 50 cents is enough that it's worth trying to trick people into getting into that article. But if you're streaming the money while they're on there, and your web monetization provider can be like, these guys are terrible, we're just not going to send them any money, or these guys are great, we're going to send them a lot of money. And, and I think that's super important because a lot of the privacy issues come from advertising. A lot of the reasons that like the internet sucks comes from the advertising model that websites use that force, if I'm going to give you an ad, the more I know about you, the more you're worth to me. Whereas if you're paying me to access my site, none of those privacy issues become a problem. So I think that's, that's really big. That's exciting. So you're saying within a year or two, we might all have like a little digital wallet with some, you know, Bitcoin or XRP or stable coins in it and just stream the money to the sites we like? Exactly. In thousands of a penny increments or even smaller. Huh, very cool. And, and I, I'm repeating myself, but how far away are we from that? Well, we have it now. It's just a matter of, ado of adoption. All of the technology is here. So there's still connectivity needed, like, you know, how can I get money in with, like, a credit card? Coil already does that. Coil, I pay Coil $5 a month on my credit card, and they stream money to the websites that I visit. And there are websites now that will thank me for donating. So, so it's, it, it's happening now. And what makes that work is this idea that we can make payments ridiculously cheaply. The, the payment is no more expensive than any other, like, internet request. And I think that's the magic that makes that work. And we could build enterprise payments on top of micropayments. You can do anything with micropayments, just like you can do any data thing with packets, as long as you can send enough of them, same thing. Very cool. We are almost out of time. I promised we'd play the game that they like to do here called overrated, underrated. So mm -hmm. I will give you a word. You just you can always say overrated or underrated. Facebook. Overrated. Ethereum. Underrated. Bitcoin. Oh, boy. I'm going <laughs> to say overrated at the risk of, but uh, under protest. Okay. Ask it with an asterisk. All right. All right. Jamie Dimon. <laughs> overrated. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to get in trouble all for right. that, aren't I? All right. 
EOS. Overrated. Ripple. <laughs> if I don't say underrated, I'm probably not going to have yeah, a job. Yeah, that's good. So. Call you. <laughs> yeah. All right, on that note, thanks very much for a really interesting conversation. Let's give it up for David Schwartz, please. Thanks, Jeff.